Well, we're grateful for today, grateful for this morning, and thank you for the cooler weather. I do ask, Father, that your spirit would be with us um, as we try to get into your word uh, this morning in Sunday school and also in the main service that follows as we try to look at a somewhat controversial passage. And I just pray that you would be with us as we seek to fulfill your commands for your church, which is to um, break bread and wine, drink wine together in terms of the communion table, the Lord's Supper. I pray we'll have a right focus there. And I just pray that you'll knit our hearts together in, in fellowship as we uh, seek to glorify you. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Well, come on in, everybody. If you could locate uh, Daniel 12 in your Bible. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. And as you know, we're continuing our study on the doctrine of the rapture. Having covered what is the rapture, 10 characteristics, we move then to when is the rapture. Not setting a date or anything, of course, but getting into the discussion of when does the rapture happen relative to the coming seven-year tribulation period. We explained seven reasons why we won't be here for this seven-year tribulation period. So the rapture occurs first. And from there, we went into a section called Strengthening the Case, where we looked at a bunch of passages that we hadn't had a chance to speak on yet and how those support the pre-trib rapture. And then the hard part of the study is interacting with the opposition. <clears throat> because most Christians believe in a rapture, um, a translation, a catching up of some kind. The, the debate is not so much on the what question, but the when question. So our view is at the top of the chart and in contradistinction to that view is mid-tribulationalism. The rapture is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation period. We took a look at that view and we're in the middle of sort of dissecting what's called post-tribulationalism. Most uh, evangelical scholars today are pre-millennial, meaning they think that the kingdom is going to come after Jesus returns, which is true, but they're post-tribulational. They think the church is going to be here for the tribulation before the kingdom materializes. So they're post-pre, which is different than our position, which is pre-pre. Um, so the post-trib view is really there, the third from the bottom. It, it doesn't really see a distinction between the rapture and the second advent. It merges it all together into one event at the end of the tribulation. So they have five arguments that they use to support their view. And we've gone through arguments one, two, three, and four. And we're, we were in the process last time of interacting with their fifth argument. Their fifth argument is they believe that their view is the one that was taught by the early church. So they argue here, number five, the post-tribulational rapture position has been the dominant view held by theologians, and we might even say the church fathers, throughout the history of the church. So I gave you this quote from George Ladd. And George Ladd argues every church father who deals with the subject, that is the timing of the rapture, who deals with the subject expects the church to suffer at the hands of the Antichrist. And the prevailing view is post-tribulational premillennial. So uh, basically they believe that the church fathers taught that the church will go through the tribulation, be rescued at the end, assuming you're alive, uh, 
and then Jesus would start his kingdom. It's called post, pre-post, how's that? It's a little confusing, isn't it? Um, and they basically have, well, they, they basically rely a lot on this fifth argument, and it's an appeal to church history. So what I was doing was I was giving sort of a response to that appeal. And last time we were together, we pointed out that first, the issue is not when the view became popular, but is it taught in the Bible? So when people want to get into this whole discussion about the church fathers, I usually don't take the bait because I don't really think what they say is that important. Uh, I know that sounds sort of sacrilegious to say that. But, you know, our source of authority is always the Bible. The church fathers are kind of like dessert after having the main course meal, you know. Um, they're fun to look at and see what they believed on different things. But there's a lot of things the church fathers taught that I don't think are in the Bible. A lot of them, for example, believed you had to be baptized to get to heaven. That's not a biblical teaching. And um, Paul the Apostle said in Acts 20, verse 29, that after my departure, the apostles, in other words, savage wolves would come in, not sparing the flock. And we saw that last time in Acts 20, verse 29. And so Paul himself is saying, your source of authority as a Christian is always the Bible, the whole Bible and nothing but the Bible. We don't interpret the Bible through the lens of the church fathers. Rather, it's the other way around. We interpret the church fathers through the lens of Scripture. And the second thing that we said last time is the idea that the earliest church fathers were all post-tribulational is very debatable because the earliest church fathers believed in something called eminency. They believed that Jesus could come back and rescue the church at any moment. In other words, if you ask them, is Jesus coming back today, they would all say yes. And that's what you call eminency. And that's really how to figure out where someone is on the rapture issue. Uh, you just ask them a simple question, can Jesus come back today? Uh, Mid-tribs say no. Three-quarters rapturists at the bottom say no. Post-tribs say no, because there's got to be seven years of tribulation first, but we're the only view that says yes. Jesus can come back in the next split second. So a lot of you are in positions where you're looking for a new church, or you send me emails saying, what about this guy, what about that guy? And there's an easy way to figure out where people are, and you just ask them, can Jesus come back today? If they, if they start to squirm and, you know, not answer the question directly, it basically means they're not pre-tribulational. Someone who's committed to pre-tribulationalism believes that Jesus can come back today. And as you go through the church fathers, they may not have had a well-developed prophetic eschatological scheme in place, but many of them, and I showed you some quotes from them last time, believed in eminency. They believed that Jesus could come back at any moment. J. Dwight Pentecost says the early church lived in light of the belief in the imminent return of Christ. Their expectation was that Christ could return at any time. Pre-tribulationalism, which is our view, the view at the top there, is the only position consistent with the doctrine of eminence. So when post-trib say, well, all the church fathers believed X, it's, you take that with a grain of salt because you can find a lot of ideas in the early church fathers that don't comport with post-tribulationalism at all. And my third response to this appeal to antiquity is where we just started looking at that third response last time. That's why I had you open up to Daniel 12. The third response is prophetic truth is designed by the Holy Spirit 
to become progressively more understandable as the world approaches the allotted time period when the prophecies will be fulfilled. In other words, as, you, as humanity drifts closer and closer to the time when these prophecies will be fulfilled, what the Holy Spirit does is he starts to peel back a lack of understanding. And those that are living in the general season when the prophecies will be fulfilled by the Holy Spirit's design have a greater understanding than the sages of the past on prophecy. Why is that? Because we're smarter? No. It's because they were living in the wrong time period and we are living in the correct time period. So when we get into this subject, you have to learn to distinguish between God's three methods of communication. God, when he gave his word, communicated in three ways. The first is something called revelation. Revelation means disclosure. So God to the biblical writers like John in the book of Revelation, like Daniel, he gave to them revelation. He gave to them a disclosure of his truth. And then when those biblical writers wrote it down, now the communication process moves from revelation to inspiration. Inspiration is the recording of truth. So we believe that everything that God showed to the biblical writers was recorded in his word in the original manuscripts without error. And we call that a movement from revelation to inspiration. So revelation, the disclosure, inspiration, the recording of it in written form. And 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 is a great verse on inspiration. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 is a great set of verses on inspiration because it talks about how the writers of scripture were carried along much like a the imagery is like of a, of a sailboat. Just as wind fulfill, fills the sails on a sailboat and the sailboat is propelled. In the same way, the Holy Spirit came upon the writers of Scripture and propelled them to record God's truth. And in the process, the Holy Spirit respected their individual gifts and temperaments and writing styles and personalities. As you read the Bible, you'll see the personalities of the different biblical writers coming out. And we call that dual authorship of Scripture. Basically what we believe is Scripture has an author, capital A, God. And then it has authors, little a, those that God chose to disclose his truth to and to record the pages of God's word. So it's, a, it's an amazing miracle that God did in the recording of his word. And then those two ministries, revelation has ceased. Inspiration has ceased. We don't have new books of the Bible being written today. A lot of people, you know, they, they put up a blog and they say I was a Christian blog and they say I was so inspired, you know, when I wrote this. Well, I mean, maybe you were energetic and you had the liver quiver or whatever going, but it wasn't inspired like what we're talking about here. Uh, inspiration biblically means people that actually recorded God's word without error, uh, Spiritual error or factual error, historical error, mathematical error, geographical error in written form. So those ministries are ceased. But there is a third ministry that, of communication that the Holy Spirit is still doing, and that's a ministry called illumination. Is God revealing truth today? No, not the way we're describing it. Is he inspiring truth today? No, not the way we are describing it. Is he illuminating truth today? Yes, he is. Illumination is the ministry that the Holy Spirit, and that's why we open with prayer. I prayed for God's blessing on our time together. 
because as a human teacher, I'm in desperate need of the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit allows us to understand what was written. So before I became a Christian, I tried to read the Bible. I could not make any sense of it. It was one of the strangest books I'd ever seen. But after I got saved and the Holy Spirit was inside of me, it was completely different. Suddenly the Bible started to jump off the page as if it was talking directly to me. That's what you call illumination. And illumination is such that the Holy Spirit will show you as a 21st century Bible reader what the Bible is saying. But when the Holy Spirit does that, he will respect the rules of grammar and syntax and exegesis because it was the Holy Spirit that allowed the Bible to be recorded in written form to begin with. So the moment it was put in written form is the moment all of the laws of language come into effect. And as you learn proper Bible study methodology and you ask the Lord and you keep short accounts with the Lord um, in terms of confessing sins and you have direct fellowship with the Lord, the Lord will start to show you what was meant in his word as you apply proper Bible study hermeneutical methodology. So that's basically what we call illumination. So there's revelation completed, inspiration completed, but now today he is doing this great ministry of illumination. And if you want some Bible verses on illumination, you could write down 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, uh, 1 John 2 verse 20 and verse 27. And that's why Jesus in John 3 told Nicodemus, you must be born again, not just to enter the kingdom, but to see the kingdom, to understand it, to perceive it. And that's why an unsaved person can't make heads or tails of spiritual things because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them, illuminating. So with, that, with those definitions in mind, what do I say here concerning post-tribulationalism's appeal to antiquity? Uh, third response, prophetic truth is designed by the Holy Spirit to become progressively more understandable as the world approaches the allotted time period when the prophecies will be fulfilled. And this is a, something I think that is special, and I'll give you the biblical evidence in just a moment, but it's special related to prophecy. As you start to move closer to the time period when the prophecies will come into existence, suddenly you understand the prophecies better than the prior generation and the generation before that. And so we're living in a time period where we actually understand Daniel's prophecies better than Daniel himself. We understand what John recorded in the book of Revelation better than John himself understood it because John was living in the wrong era. So was Martin Luther, so was John Calvin, so was Irenaeus, uh, so was Eusebius, and all of these great sages of the past that the post-trib people are quoting all of the time. And my point is, why are you quoting them? They're living in the wrong era. Given this doctrine of progressive illumination. So as you start to study prophecy, what you see is, aha, you have these aha moments. For example, there's a prophecy in Revelation 11 about two witnesses being killed in the city streets of Jerusalem. And it says there around verse 8 that the whole world is going to see their dead bodies. Now, how would Eusebius or Martin Luther or John Calvin or any of them understood that? They couldn't make heads or tails of that. In fact, it's kind of comical to go back and watch them in their commentaries try to make sense of it. You know, but here we are in the 21st century and, it, and we don't have to wonder how it could be fulfilled anymore because all you got to do is pick up your cell phone and if you go to the right website, you can see what's streaming right now on the city streets of Jerusalem. And so now history has caught up 
with what the Bible said would come, and you can see completely how the whole world could see something happening in the city streets of Jerusalem. That's just one example. But God has designed prophecy to be that way. And you, you look back and you read Revelation 11 and you say it's always been there. There's nothing new in terms of revelation and inspiration. It's, it's always been there, but gosh, I understand it now. And that's an illumination issue. So if all of this is true, um, I'm not really all that concerned about what the sages of the past said about the tribulation and the rapture, the way post-tribs are, because they're not understanding this doctrine of progressive illumination. So if you go back into our studies on the rapture early on, you know, one of the points I made about the rapture is the rapture is an old truth gradually being recovered. And I talked a little bit about progressive illumination then, and so I'm sort of revisiting it here by way of response to post-tribulationalism's appeal to antiquity. Now, I made the point last time that we want to be very clear that inspiration and revelation are done. Truth has once and for all been delivered to the saints. Uh, in fact, John in Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19 pronounces a very severe curse on anybody that would add to the written word of God. So revelation done, inspiration done. There are no new books of the Bible being written to, but suddenly I'm reading prophetic scripture and I'm understanding things that generations before me couldn't understand. That's not a revelation issue. That's not an inspiration issue. That's, that's an illumination issue. And that's what God said would happen. Um, and that's why I had you open up to Daniel 12, verse 4 and verse 9, which is one of the great passages that deals with this issue of progressive illumination related to Scripture. So here's Daniel back in the 6th century, and he receives this incredible vision from an angel. The angel, I think, was Gabriel. And he receives that in chapter 10, 11, and 12, and he's living 600 years before the time of Christ, and he wants to know what it means. I mean, that would be an obvious question, wouldn't, wouldn't it, if you were Daniel and you received all this information? What does it mean? So he asked the angel, what does it mean? And this is the response. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. And then if you drop down to verse 9, the angel says, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until what? The time of the end. So Daniel says, tell me what it means. And the angel says, it's really none of your business, Daniel. You're not even in the right generation to understand it. By the way, you've done a good job, Daniel, receiving the truth and recording it, and you're going to rise in the final resurrection, so you've done your job, now go back to work as a leader in the <laughs> Persian government. Don't worry about understanding it, because you're in the wrong time period, but there's coming a time in history when people living in the right generation will understand it. Because many are going to go back and forth and knowledge is going to increase. But until that happens, the truth is sealed until the time of the end. So it's been revealed and it's been recorded. It's just not for you to, to understand it in its fullness. Now when you get into this verse here, knowledge will increase. Boy, there's a lot of interesting sermons preached on that. I've heard people talk about cruise liners and the internet and aircraft carriers and they say look at how knowledge has increased in the last days there are verses you could go to to talk about the technology explosion in the last days but this verse is not one of them it's not talking about an explosion in terms of techno technology 
technological learning, it's talking about an explosion in terms of prophetic understanding. That's the knowledge that will increase. Why? Because many are going to go back and forth. Going back and forth is not traveling all over the world in an, air, in an airliner. Going back and forth is reading. All of a sudden, you, you pull out your Bible. These things were written, in some cases, thousands of years ago. And you're looking at your Bible, and you're looking at the world, and you're having these aha moments. Oh, that's how that's going to happen. Oh, that's how that's going to happen. So when you cross-reference this with Amos 8, verse 12, going to and fro has to do with seeking God's word in terms of reading. Amos 8, verse 12 predicts people will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. Now look at this. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. That concerns a lot of different things, but the only thing I wanted you to focus on is notice how going to and fro is not jetline air travel. Going to and fro is seeking God's word. It's reading God's word. It's being interested in God's word. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 and verse 9 specifically predicts that as the human race moves closer and closer to the time period when the prophecies will be fulfilled, the Holy Spirit would simultaneously, progressively not give new prophecies, not give new books of the Bible, but would start to peel back the understanding of human beings who are readers concerning how these things could happen. And that's what I mean by progressive illumination. Uh, most people don't understand this, but Isaac Newton, who's known for being a great scientist, was also a tremendous Bible student. Uh, Isaac Newton wrote entire commentaries on the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And some of it has just now, as I've been reading some things online about Isaac Newton, has just now, you know, been unleashed or, or published or made available to the public. And Isaac Newton was a tremendous scientist because he was a Bible student first. People need to understand this. Because the humanists who all think the science is on their side on everything climate change, the science is settled. Evolution, the science is settled. You hear that a lot in the public discourse. Science, the science is settled. Vaccination, science is settled. They're all claiming science. And it's kind of interesting to look at how a humanist treats Isaac Newton, who was one of the greatest scientists that ever lived. And they'll say things like, gosh, I wish Isaac Newton hadn't wasted so much of his life studying the Bible because he was such a wonderful scientist. Think of everything else he could have accomplished if he just put the Bible down and just gave himself to science. The fact of the matter is it was Isaac Newton's knowledge of the Bible that gave him an incentive to be a scientist. Because Isaac Newton, as a biblicist, as a theist, as a Christian, believed that the creator had put into the universe and our world certain laws. And so Isaac Newton wanted to figure out what those laws were. One of which he codified, you know, the law of gravity. Objects fall at 32 feet, what is it, 32 feet per second, something, something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm not much of a scientist myself, but my point is this idea that I wish Newton had just dumped the Bible and given himself to science is total nonsense. It was his knowledge of the Bible that gave him an incentive to study the laws of nature. Isaac Newton looked at science the same way a Christian looks at a Bible study. 
You know, God has revealed himself in scripture. God has revealed himself in nature. So I'm going to study the world around me with the same enthusiasm that I study the Bible because God has spoken in both. You see that? So Isaac Newton was a great scientist, but he was a tremendous biblical scholar. And he had a real affinity for the books of prophecy like Daniel and Revelation. And when Isaac Newton was commenting on Daniel 12, verse 4, which we just read, and verse 9, he made this statement, and it's, it's uh, prescient in what he said. He said, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up uh, who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst, <coughs> excuse me, in the midst of much clamor and opposition. <laughs> Close quote. I look at that and I say, wow, that's dead on point. But what Newton is acknowledging here is this concept spoken of in the book of Daniel called progressive illumination. The generations that come before won't fully understand these prophecies, but the generation that is on the earth when these things are about to happen, boy, they're going to be screaming at the top of their, their lungs about it. Um, let me give you some more examples of progressive illumination. If you look at Daniel 8, verse 27, you have one of the clearest prophecies of progressive illumination. By the way, this is a prophecy, Daniel 8, that Daniel had about the ram and the goat. And we've done verse-by-verse verse teaching through Daniel at our church, so you can find all of that on our sermon archives. But the ram is Persia, the goat is Greece. It's speaking of how Persia would overthrow Greece, and that happened in 331 B.C., um, excuse me, I may have had that backwards, how Greece would overthrow Persia, there we go. And that happened in 331 BC, Alexander the Great, all of those things. And Daniel is having a prediction about it in Daniel 8. And then it goes on, Daniel does in Daniel 8, and he starts talking about things that would happen at the end of the empire of Greece once the Grecians overthrew the Persians. And he talks about the desecration of the temple uh, where the nation of Israel would get Hanukkah, the concept of Hanukkah, from the miracle that God would do to, to preserve Israel during that time period. And so now Daniel is speaking of things that would happen 400 years after he had this vision. These are things that would happen in 167 BC. So when did Daniel prophesy? He prophesied in 551 BC, the third year of Belshazzar. In fact, by the time he prophesied, the Persians hadn't even conquered the Babylonians yet. And now in Daniel 8, Daniel is having a prediction given to him by the Holy Spirit concerning how the Greeks are gonna overthrow the Persians and then how the Greeks are going to actually desecrate one of them. Antiochus Epiphanes is going to desecrate the Jewish temple. So Daniel is seeing things in 551 BC that wouldn't be fulfilled for 200 years. And as you get into the end of the Grecian Empire, he's seeing actually things that wouldn't happen for 400 years. So again, he has this vision and he's frustrated because he doesn't know what it means, just like he was in Daniel 12. And so Daniel says, then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Now, interrupting the quote here, why was he exhausted and sick for days? Because he's seeing the suffering that his people, Israel, are going to go through. Then I, Daniel, was sick, exhausted, and sick for days. Keep in mind, this is a guy that was a high-ranking government agent official in Babylon at the time. 
Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. So he couldn't even understand what he saw. Why? Because God, through Daniel, had fulfilled revelation. God, through Daniel, had fulfilled inspiration. But Daniel is living 200 to 400 years in the wrong generation to understand illumination. But as the world drifted closer and closer to the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies, what the Holy Spirit started to do with people is not give them new prophecies, not inspire new books of the Bible, but to, as we like to say, push back the frontiers of ignorance So people could understand, oh my goodness, this is what Daniel said. In other words, little old me understands Daniel better than Daniel. In fact, Daniel cried out for understanding and the angel in Daniel 12 just said, go your way. And here he wants to understand what he saw in Daniel 8, but it says there was none to explain it. Why why wasn't there anybody to explain it? Because he's living in the wrong generation. See that? He's living centuries before this would happen. So that's what I mean by progressive um, illumination. The Old Testament prophets who predicted the coming Messiah were very frustrated as well. Uh, You have to put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. The Holy Spirit gives to Isaiah a prophecy in Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7, about a Messiah that's going to rule and reign. Then the same Holy Spirit gives to Isaiah a prophecy in Isaiah 53 about the Messiah suffering and dying. Now, what would you do if you're Isaiah? I mean, you would say, what's the deal? I mean, you just told me he's going to rule and reign. Now you're giving me a vision about how he's going to suffer and die. So he's, he's very frustrated. Isaiah doesn't even understand his own prophecies. That's why as you go back into interpreters prior to the time of Christ, what you start to see them develop is they thought there was going to be two messiahs, not one. Because they couldn't make sense of a Messiah suffering, Isaiah 53, and a Messiah ruling and reigning, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. So they called the suffering Messiah that they thought was going to come, Ben Joseph, Ben meaning son, son of Joseph, and they called him that because of all of the sufferings that Joseph went through. And then the other Messiah they called Ben David, or you know we would pronounce it Ben David, son of David, because that's the Messiah that's going to rule and reign over the kingdom, just like David did when he was here, uh, roughly three thousand years ago. So you have in Old Testament rabbinical literature, Old Testament uh, going back pre-Christ in Judaism. Uh, a total inability to make sense of a suffering Messiah and a reigning Messiah to the point where they postulated, well, there's got to be two Messiahs. And the Apostle Peter makes reference to this and the frustration and the consternation of the Old Testament prophets when Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he says, as to this salvation, referring to Christ, the prophets, that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all the rest of them, the prophets prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries. In other words, they had a bunch of unanswered questions, seeking to know what person Or time, Peter says, see that? Or time, the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So here's Isaiah receiving this information 700 years before the time of Christ. And Isaiah is making careful searches and inquiries because the prophecies don't make any sense to him. Because they seem like they contradict each other. So they start to develop, there's got to be two messiahs. 
Now, why is it that little old me can understand those prophecies and Isaiah couldn't? It's not a revelation issue. God hasn't given me some new truth that Isaiah never had. It's not an inspiration issue. I'm not writing down new books of the Bible. But it's an illumination issue. Because I'm living at the right time in history when these prophecies were fulfilled. And as they say, hindsight is what? 2020. I have the vantage point of hindsight. Where I can look back and I can say, oh, I know what it means. Isaiah 53, that was fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, that's going to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. And I, as a member of Christ's church, is living in between the two. Now, Isaiah didn't have that luxury. Um, he received all of the truth that we have. But I have the vantage point of progressive illumination living in the right time period when I can make sense of it or Isaiah could not make sense of it not because he was less smart than I am he was just living in the wrong time period you see that this is a concept called progressive illumination now one of the most valuable <clears throat> studies well even before we get to that just want to reiterate that we can understand Bible prophecy better than the prophets themselves because of our vantage point of history. And if the Lord tarries and we are not the rapture generation, these kids are going to grow up, hopefully in Christ, and they're going to look back at us and say, well, they had it wrong here and they had it wrong there because they're living even closer. And if another generation after them arises, that generation will understand it even better than our kids. And, of course, the generation of believers in the tribulation period itself will understand it the best, right? Because <laughs> they're living it. So one of the most valuable studies you could ever give yourself to as a Christian is what's called the history of doctrine. Uh, we teach this at Chafer theological seminary we have some really good guys that teach this for us that specialize in this uh, Robert Dean of West Houston I think has a master's degree in this and Dr. John Eidsmo is one of our teachers on this also but it's a subject called history of doctrine and it's not so much a church history course as it is how did doctrines that we today accept and take for granted, how did those get worked out? Um, what you discover is the Holy Spirit began to unfold doctrinal truth to the church, not give them new doctrine, but help them to understand what the Bible says in various phases. And it related a lot of the times to the fact that heretics were coming into the church and teaching certain perverse ideas. And so the church, because of a heretic, was forced to counteract by crystallizing what the Bible actually says in juxtaposition to a heretic. So that's why heretics are not always the worst thing that can happen. Because a heretic forces you to think it, he forces you to formulate, to simplify what it is the Bible is saying. And that's a, uh, an analysis that we call the history of doctrine. So AD 180, the church, and this is a very rough sketch, but AD 180, the church starts to get into the issue of canonicity. What books of the Bible are part of the canon and what parts books of the Bible are not part of the biblical canon. And then heretics arose and they began to challenge the doctrine of Christ. So the church starts to crystallize Christology roughly A.D. 500. Very rough sketch here. And then you get into this issue, issue of atonement. When Jesus died, what, what did that mean? 
Because people were arising and saying, well, when Jesus died on the cross, he just died to show his love for us. He just died to show how important we are and how valuable we are. And the church said, no, those things might be subtruths, but when Jesus died on the cross, he died as my substitute. And if he hadn't died on the cross, I would be there hanging. That's a formulation of atonement. This is where we get these fancy words, penal, vicarious, substitutionary atonement. Penal punishment, he was punished in our place. Vicarious, he died in my place. And then atonement, substitute, he died as my substitute. So when a liberal preacher says Jesus just died to show how much care he has for us and how much love he has for us, it's kind of like, yeah, we, we dealt with that in the 1100s, sir. I'm not denying, sir, what you're saying, but there's a lot more to it uh, in terms of his being our substitute. That's what liberal theology denies. They do not believe Jesus was our substitute. So the church hammers that out around 1100. Now notice the late date there. Church has been in existence for a millennium and is just now getting to the doctrine of the atonement. And then the Protestant Reformation comes and God raises up men like Martin Luther and they start to get into the whole subject of sola fide, sola Christus, Faith alone, in Christ alone. Why would Luther get embroiled in that? Because he was challenged by the Roman Catholic establishment that salvation is not based on faith alone. It's based on good works plus faith. So God raises up Luther about A.D. 1500. That's a very rough sketch. To start hammering out the doctrine of salvation. And you know, you go through this history and you start to appreciate our doctrines a little better. Because there's not a lot of teaching on this. And we just sort of assume that, well, every Christian has always believed these doctrines that we embrace. And when you study this history of doctrine, you see that that is not the case. The church is hammering this stuff out, debating all over the place, working this out. And then look at this. Eschatology does not start to get systematized until A.D. 1800. You mean the early church was not really interested in eschatology? Well, I think they were interested in it, but they were focused on canonization, Christology, atonement, salvation. And then finally, the Holy Spirit gets the church into a position where now it can start thinking about eschatological matters. Now, why wasn't eschatology developed and systematized first? Well, it has to do with progressive illumination. The Holy Spirit specifically said these prophecies would be there, recorded, revealed, but you could, you're not going to make heads or tails of them until you're living in the right time period when these prophecies will, be, will occur. So it is no accident that when you study the history of doctrine that eschatology is the last guy on the list. Because of this doctrine of progressive illumination. Um, Here I quote uh, James Orr, who describes this in his Progress of Doctrine. And before I quote him, I, I say Orr outlines the progress of Christian dogma in a similar way. And here's a quote from James Orr. And he's explaining exactly what I just walked you through. He says, quote, the second century was the age of apologetics. The doctrine of God and especially the Trinity then took center stage in the third and fourth century as the church dealt with monarchian, Arian, Macedonian controversies. Now let me interrupt myself here. Why would the church start thinking about the Trinity all of a sudden in the third and fourth century? Because the church is being challenged by heretics. Who are the heretics? Or mentions them. Monarchianism. 
Macedonianism and Arianism. Arius is the heretic that arose and he started to say Jesus is a created being. He started to say there was a time in which he was not. Which, by the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses, not if they come to your house, but when they come to your house, will teach the same thing to you. And really what the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing is they're just recycling uh, an ancient heresy called Arianism. And so the church has to start hammering out the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, is Jesus a created being? The early church said no, and that's where the Creed of Nicaea comes from. About A.D. 325, and that's why there's a line in the Nicene Creed of Jesus that says, begotten and not what? Made. Begotten, he's unique. He's the monogenes. That's, that's translated begotten in John 3.16 and other passages. Monogenes, mono, you recognize that word, one. Genos, species or kind. If you're a biology student, I think they call them what? Genus or genus or something like that. It comes from genos. One of a kind. Jesus is one of a kind. So the church in response to Arius was saying, Jesus is one of a kind, but we do not believe that he was ever made or created. We believe that before the virgin conception, he eternally existed. And so now we're in the third of the fourth century and the church is dealing with the whole subject of Trinitarianism because they're being challenged now on the issue of Trinitarianism by the heretic Arius. And as this process unfolds, what is the Holy Spirit doing with the church? He's, he's allowing the church to crystallize its thinking on all of these issues. And this isn't taught, and we don't appreciate the wars that went on, the debates that went on, to get to us a lot of the doctrines that we just read and take for granted. I mean, there's a whole history here. And history of the doctrine course covers these issues. So continuing with the quote, Orr goes on and he says, anthropology, that's the study of man, what does the Bible say about man, then became the church's focus in the early 5th century during the Augustinian and Pelagian controversies. See, see that there? It's the Augustinian and Pelagian controversies regarding the goodness, the inherent goodness of man that forced the church to go back and say, what does the Bible say about man? in terms of our depravity. Or goes on, quote, he says, the late 5th and 6th centuries were characterized by an ecclesiological interest in Christological matters. Why? Because there was Nestorianism and Eutychianism and Monophysitism <laughs> and mon Monothelitism, which were either pro or challenging. And then Orr goes on and says in the 16th century, I mean, the church has been in existence for a millennia, over a millennia and a half now. And now they're finally getting to salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. I mean, what took them so long? The 16th century, the reformers focused on salvific or soteriological concerns. Soteriology is just a fancy name for meaning the doctrine of salvation. How, how do you get saved? Um, Roman Catholic Church was teaching one idea. The reformers started to say the Bible is teaching a different idea. And then Orr says, finally, the church gave itself to correcting a mythical and medieval pre-Reformation eschatology, close quote. There was a guy who put the church under a shadow. I deal with it in my book, ever reforming, where I try to explain all these things in an, hopefully an easy to understand format. If you're interested, I can give you a copy of that book, uh, Ever Reforming. The elders bought a bunch of them for you. I, I really should have put those out at the back table. And I'll even autograph it for you, which 
might send the value down, I don't know. Um, so if you sell it on eBay, you might get a less, might be better if you didn't have an autograph edition. Anyway, so Augustine brought in amillennialism in the fourth century, and he wrote a book called The City of God, and he convinced that, that, that Christianity, that the church was the kingdom of God. Now, why would, why would people be open to that idea? Because the church had been under persecution since Nero. And now you've got a guy on the throne named Constantine, about A.D. 313, and with the stroke of a pen. Aren't we all upset about edicts at the stroke of a pen with the current administration? I mean, this is what uh, Constantine did in a good sense. With the stroke of a pen, he said the, Christ, the, era, the, era, the era of formal persecution against Christianity is over. And Christianity has now been elevated to the favored religion in Rome. So with the stroke of a pen, the church that had been under persecution from Rome... Ever since the days of Nero, roughly A.D. 64, all of a sudden all of that persecution is erased and the church is promoted. The devil, in other words, stops persecuting the church because the problem from Satan's standpoint of persecuting the church is the church keeps growing through persecution. Have you noticed that in the book of Acts? The church is growing like crazy underground in China, it's growing like crazy in Iran. Why? What do those areas have in common? Christians are under persecution. The church has been stagnant in the United States of America, partly because we haven't been under the persecution the rest of the world has been un under. So maybe the last election, when you look at it from that standpoint, maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe God's getting ready in the United States. To grow the church again. I don't know. But finally, they got around to correcting this kingdom now mindset that reigned over the church ever since Augustine. And they didn't start doing that until, what does it say here, around 1800. So Orr says eschatology is the last area to be systematized. So my concluding statement here is thus eschatology was the last of the branches to be systematized since it was not eschatology designed to be progressively unsealed or illumined by the Holy Spirit until just before the predicted events transpire. Daniel 12 verse 4 verses 8 and 9. Why didn't eschatology get resolved first? Progressive illumination. The church is living in the wrong time period. But now as the church is moving to the end of the church age, suddenly you look at the prophecies of Daniel and John in the book of Revelation and Daniel, and you say, I understand, you have these aha moments. I understand what he was talking about. So let's hammer this out, just like we did Trinitarianism. And the atonement and soteriology. Now that history is what is completely and totally ignored by post-tribulationalists and others that think their view is important because it's what the ancients taught. When you understand the doctrine of progressive illumination as I've tried to explain it, of course you don't anchor your case in what the ancients taught. They're living in the wrong generation. Eusebius says this, and Calvin says this, and Luther says this, and my response is, who cares? They were good on their issues, but they didn't know heads or tails about eschatology, and the Holy Spirit designed it that way. You follow? So understanding the progress of doctrine, in, in my mind, rebuts post-tribulationalism's appeal to antiquity so what we're moving into now or starting next week now that we've answered the post-trib 
issues is I'm going to speak on five problems that are unique only to post-tribulationalism. And then once we finish that, we'll move into an analysis of pre-wrath, rapturism. Once we finish that, then I'll do a lesson or maybe two on what is going to happen one second after the rapture for believers and unbelievers. And then once we finish that, the series will be over. Assuming we finish it before the rapture. Amen? All right, let me close in prayer. Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for uh, the fact that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, really. Thankful for how you worked in the past to give us what we have today. Help us to leave here with a gratitude, not only for what Jesus has done for us, um, but also for how you've worked in history to give us the doctrines that we now have. We'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, God's people said. Amen. Happy intermission.